Well, th thanks for um, thanks for having me, and thank you all. And I, I love the you know to be back here again and, and thinking of the title of this of of future and review and really being the visionaries who think for our species about where we're going and where we're heading. I'm a biological oceanographer, so I'm the one who brings all the bad news um, about the ocean and about the CO2. And I think I want to bring an upbeat message, though, today, because I've been thinking of um, the, the thing that I love the most, which is coral reefs, have been just drastically declining. And being a scientist, going out there every year and just reporting, we lost 10%, 20% each year following the CO2, no matter what the administration is, watching it creep up and up and up, um, has got me think about how, as a scientist, can I have the capacity to, to make some change. And some of the things I realize is that all these amazing inventions that you're talking about, we have the technology really to change. We probably have the technology if we wanted to, to bring the CO2 to 180 parts per millionth, which is a glacial period, and go back into an ice age. But if we did do that, would we be okay? What do you think in the room? If we drop down to an ice age, 180 ppm, is the solutions for Homo sapiens solved? No, right? They're much deeper than that. This is almost why I wanted to go get a psychology degree. This is a rational behavior. This is human psychology. And I'll just show you quick run-throughs of things that I'm doing in my science that I call it subversive empathy building because um, I'll take over, or not take over, I'll work with different labs and, um, and try to come up with projects that actually use technology to connect us to life. And the hypothesis is if that if we connect to life, we will see that we're a part of it, we're just one of millions of species, and we'll then be able to kind of drive Spaceship Earth better. I don't know if that's gonna happen or not, but I'm gonna plan it for it. So animal eye cameras. Um, I discovered a fluorescent shark a few years ago. Everyone started asking, what does it mean to be a fluorescent shark? So I, um, this is more of an interdisciplinary approach of taking, like looking at the pigments in the eye, using something called microspectrophotometry to look in there and see exactly what the visual reality of the world of that shark is. It's a monochromat. So even when we think about our eyes, us being mammalian primates, we've designed all our technology in RGB so it suits our crazy little bodies, ourselves. Um, so this shark, if they was to make its own iPhone, it would be a very different iPhone. Um, but beyond that, um, I could then make use the technology that we have to make something like a shark eye camera and to connect to the world, to see the world from the eye of a shark. Um, this is just, I'll just briefly go through some of them. You can look up some of these papers um, in detail to just kind of put the reference into it. Um, here is the shark itself. And what we can see, as you can't see there, is it gives us this impression that this is a secret pattern that these sharks can see other sharks. So it, it, by getting behind the eye, by using the technology, we could start seeing things from their perspective, which makes all these things start making sense. I also found a fluorescent turtle a few years ago. It worked its way all the way onto Saturday Night Live, where they made a parody of it. And now I'm building, using hyperspectral imagery, um, making turtle eye cameras, because the turtle eye is so much more complicated than a monochromat, and it actually has multiple rods, multiple cones, double cones, as well as colored oil droplets, which are really interesting. Um, so I can't just use a regular camera. I've got to use special hyperspectral and then write the algorithms to see from that world, which is fun, because I, and then I get to go swim with the turtle with eye charts and make eye graphs to see how this uh, shark is seeing the world. And all these, I'm glad you like that. Yeah, this, is, this was a fun exercise in using mathematical modeling is to see how a shark versus a turtle sees. Um, I've also been collaborating really deeply with Rob Wood's um, lab at the Harvard Microrobotics Laboratory at the Wies Institute. And just some of the things, we've been into this idea of gentle robots. And this just came out in Science Robotic a few weeks ago. And we believe it's one of the most gentle robots ever created. It could handle, it could touch, a jellyfish at one-tenth of the pressure that the eyelid rests on the eyeball. Um, so it's the idea of using technology to create gentleness, to create empathy, to connect us. Um, this, and it actually went further with that, so here's the yeah, ultra-gentle manipulation, and we're currently doing a study, and we've got really cool results, that it does turn out that the jellyfish produces less stress. So I did an entire transcriptomic assay where I looked at every gene being expressed, and I saw that all the stress responses when I was even, you know, hold the jellyfish tight versus using this gentle robot. So even something as primitive, 500 million years old as a jellyfish does experience stress. Made me totally revisit how I even see human stress. Um, here's this cool jellyfish grab. <laughs> 
Um, this is another thing that we invented called a rotary actuated dodecahedron, um, which is part of the idea of going to the deep sea, but to not extract, not have this extractive mentality. I know we hear a lot about deep sea mining. Um, there's animals in the deep sea that could be 18,000 years old. Time space takes on a whole different kind of continuum down there. And as I want to approach a new animal that I meet at the deep sea, I want to approach it with kindness and I want to approach it with care. And this is the, we're able to encapsulate this jellyfish. Once it's inside here, we could use like the DNA swab technology to get its genome. We could use um, cameras in here, which is lensless imaging, and we could take a 3D scan and we could print that to the shape and texture and let it go. And this will eventually open up, but I don't have enough time. And um, so that was this paper. Oh, another one. I was inside a submarine at night and I realized I couldn't touch anything and I couldn't do any science in the ocean. So this was a um, robotic arm, a soft robotic arm, instead of a robotic claw that goes on the front of a submarine that could delicately touch life. There it is grabbing, and it's actually doing whatever my hand is doing. And the upcoming one, this will just a little, maybe a preview for next year, but um, this was thinking about deep machine learning, and this is the first paper that's applying deep machine learning for sperm whale bioacoustics, the animal with the largest mammalian brain, totally evolutionary obscurity. It's almost like you look at it in a phylogenetic chart, it's like way on the outside. And wait, is there any sound? Oh no, wait, go back to the sound. I just wanna play a little bit of sound. All right, never mind. All right, we're out of time. We'll, we'll play that, but thank you. <laughs>